So hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming this evening. This is our second lecture in, in the series of mobile media. Um, before I introduce Jordan, I'll just quickly reintroduce the series. So last week we had the first lecture, Jonathan Harris. Today we're very lucky to have Jordan Wiseman here. And then one, actually next Thursday, we'll have Kevin Slavin. And then the day after that, Friday the 13th, we'll have the symposium. And then the workshops the following day on Saturday. So I think most of the people who I see here are affiliated with UCLA. If you're affiliated with UCLA, um, the workshops are very much free. You're very welcome to come. But you do need to sign up online. And I sent an email out to uh, all the undergrads and alumni today. Uh, if you would like to attend the workshops and you didn't receive an email from me today, just let me know. And I can send that out to you. And we're very excited about the series. I hope you can join us for more of it. So with that, I'll introduce Jordan. So Jordan's the creative force behind a number of entertainment companies, including his newest venture, Smith & Tinker. He's previously led Fossa Corporation, which focused on role-playing games, Virtual World Entertainment, which focused on networked virtual reality entertainment, which was acquired by the Disney family, Fossa Interactive, which focused on PC games, including the MechWarrior franchise, which was acquired by Microsoft, and WizKids, which was collectible games acquired by Topps, and then also 42 Entertainment, which focused on alternative reality gaming. He has an amazing, broad experience, um, and it's very exciting to have him here to, to introduce us to many of these different areas. During his career, he's created some of the largest and longest lasting franchises in the gaming industry, including the Battletech, MechWarrior, Shadowrun, and Crimson Skies. I know from talking to a lot of you today that many of you are big fans of some of those series um, and probably are here for that reason. Uh, in his current venture, Smith & Tinker, Jordan is reinventing play for today's children by creating toys and games that combine the endless expandability of online content and the power of uh, neighborhood social dynamics to create connected play experiences that move seamlessly between kids' online and offline worlds. Okay, so please uh, help me in welcoming Jordan. Thank you, Casey. Uh, good evening. Uh, based upon some earlier discussions today, I'm going to jump around through a couple different presentations. So it's likely going to be disjointed and hopefully will make some sense uh, through a couple different ideas. What we'll do is start with maybe uh, what I typically start with, which is kind of world building, trying to think about how to put characters and gameplay and the world into a, into a context that I can then build a larger structure for a transmedia kind of experience. Uh, and then bop around to kind of some of, the, some of those past uh, experiences and what, they, what they, hide, they tie together. What is transmedia? Um, well, recently a pretty abused term. Uh, when I first started using this term about, uh, I guess, 2001-ish, what I view, viewed it as is a story which really uh, gets told across a large number of media simultaneously and woven together into one. So it's not what you would call kind of a multimedia, where you're take, taking a same story and telling it in different mediums, you know, like a book to a movie, you know, to a video game. It's telling one story that is built on top of this platform that uses lots of media simultaneously and weaves them all together into one story format. Uh, to me, ultimately, the goal of that is to kind of shatter that fourth wall, um, an old theater term, that, that invisible wall that separates the actors from the audience, uh, is kind of the fourth wall of that, that box, the presidium, and, and shattering that, giving you a much more intimate connection between uh, the uh, audience and, and the characters, the, the drama itself. And so the goal of me, uh, for me of Transmedia was to do that, was to really bring you into the worlds of the characters and bring the characters into your world. Uh, as uh, Casey mentioned, uh, I'm really old. Um, I've made games for a long time. And uh, the, some of the ones, these go back for a while, and I'll cover some of these things going forward. I've also, um, like, I love telling stories. Uh, to me, games are just a medium of telling stories and, and creating socialization around those stories and, and interacting with them. Uh, but ultimately, to me, uh, I'm just a big story guy. And so uh, even my game universes, MechWarrior, Shadowrun, and so on, there's what, 300 novels that we've done in those stories, and, 
And then I realized, you know, I can probably not have to make a game out of every story. So I started writing stories that aren't games. Um, and Kathy's book and those series, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more, are, are examples of those. Um, so the uh, Smith and Tinker byline, which, uh, which got read there, uh, is, a, is a whole bunch of marketing phrases all thrown into one sentence. Um, what does it really mean? Uh, it's kind of, for me, an observation that, that's distressing uh, and that I wanted to try to, in some small way, maybe reverse. We, uh, we being this industry 25 years ago, started looking at it at saying, wow, how could we Im increase the amount of socialization that we can do with each other? Uh, because we can't always be at each other's houses. So we started building these, uh, in the beginning, very rudimentary ways of communicating from household to household in a, in a uh, entertain, you know, networked entertainment. Well, that's come along really far. It's come along so far that there are so many incentives for us to socialize via wire that there's actually a pretty big disincentive to socializing personally now. Uh, and we see this with kids all the time. My, my mom was in Chicago, was a friend of mine, was complaining about how, she wasn't really complaining, she was commenting about how uh, her son uh, goes to soccer practice, kids play soccer, you know, and then they have like three hours between the practice and the game. Now, when I was a kid, you just hang out with each other during those periods. You'd play a game, you'd do something together. Well, they want to play a game, but the only games they really want to play are at home. So the kids all split up. They all go to their relative homes, reconnect virtually online to play, uh, and then actually get back together physically later. Because the games that they can play at the table don't give them all the benefits of the games they can play online. Um, they don't have, you know, this character, which they can keep evolving and making cooler. They're not giving the badges and the rewards and all the, the accolades that go um, along with making accomplishments inside of this larger social circle online. So we've built all of these incentives for online play. And the, I think, unintended side effect is we've now basically told kids, well, don't bother sitting at the same table together because there's nothing cool to do there. <laughs> go home. Separate yourselves. That's the only place to do cool stuff. So I wanted to try to bring some of that together. And Smith and Tinker, the goal is to bring some of those dynamics back to the tabletop um, and do that in a way that, that has what you do at the table face to face, actual person to person socialization. The games you play there enhance what you do online. And what you do online enhances what you do face to face. So you get a full kind of virtuous circle of gameplay. And that's, that's what we're trying to approach in, in Smith and Tinker. And I'll walk through that. Um, so, Back to the kind of worlds, why build a world rather than just write a script uh, or, or a linear one? Uh, I always believe that, that uh, if you're just making a movie or, or you're really just writing a book, you can really just write a linear story. There's no reason actually you have to go back and, and spend a lot of work doing a huge amount of world building if you know you're just doing one thing. But if, you, if you're hoping to do something that you can like, live in for a long time, um, tell lots of stories in, write lots of novels in, hopefully make multiple movies in, then you're better off to really spend time up front to really think about what that larger world context is. Um, my method for doing that is to um, do what I do best, which is be a child. Uh, as my mom said, if I ever grow up, we're all out of business. And um, so I go back to what did I do when I was a kid. Uh, I really think that the core, fa the fantasies we played with as a child uh, they're inside of us, they're locked up, and they're like treasured little gems. And when we find things that touch on those in a more sophisticated way, but still touch on those core fantasies, we respond very positively to them. So uh, in terms of creating those fictional universes, I go back and just try to find some core fantasies to work from and then find interesting twists on those. So, you know, knights, these are boy franchises. Um, Knights in shining armor, lots of boys play with that. Big tanks, being a powerful, you know, uh, knight, a uh, a powerful kind of person of royalty, are you know all what Mech Warrior is all about, right? It's basically I'm going to take I'm going to take my knight in shining armor. I'm going to make the armor 30 foot tall so I can go step on my high school. Um, <laughs> but when I get out of the mech, I'm still nobility, right? I still have that kind that that kind of personal power, and uh, I think that's you know. The idea again, taking and then, what was the tank about? The tank about is the relationship between the man and the machine, um, and the kind of world that it's set in. I mean, BattleTech uh, Mech Warrior is literally a total ripoff of the Roman successor states 
I love history. I steal history all the time. Uh, and it's the Roman successor states set in a World War II type of setting where the tanks walk. Um, and that, at the bottom line, is all, you know, it's what it really is. That's the energy underneath there. And basing it on that historical setting meant that I really knew where my story was going. I knew what kind of characters I could have and, and how to have them all feed with each other. Uh, key thing that is when you're creating a world, create, you, now that you've got it, your core fantasy helps you guide to what you, what you want your protagonist to be. Create a world that would create your protagonist. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, kind of uh, a thing that a lot of people miss. And so you end up with very weird protagonists and settings, and settings which would never evolve them. So I'll kind of, I'm going to kind of flip through this because there's more than we want to get into. Ongoing, con you want to make sure that your protagonist is constantly employed, so create a political situation that would constantly require why your protagonist is there. Um, and then steal liberally from history. Um, and make sure that you tell stories that, uh, uh, I always say real science is not actually really hard. Um, and the less you have to make up, the better. Uh, for instance, again, another kind of example from my background, uh, combining two fantasies together, uh, a fighter pilot and a pirate is, you know, what Crimson Skies was all about, right? Um, take, two, take fantasies that are out there, people already have touchstones to them, and get to them. Um, so I think I'm going to click over to a different one. That, isn't, that, isn't that guy cute? He's, uh, he's called TikTok. Um, and, uh, He's from uh, Wizard of Oz. Um, Wizard of Oz actually was seven books, because like, just like I was talking about, when you create a good world, you can milk it forever. And Baum um, milked it forever. You know, we, only, we only know one book, because only one was made into the big movie. But the other seven were all bestsellers in his day. And in book two, he created this character, which was one of the first Western mentions of an autonomous, sentient, robotic-type character called TikTok. Uh, and in the story, TikTok is created by Smith and Tinker, which is where the company name comes from. So, uh, I'm going to switch over here. Talk about monkeys. Um, Transmedia came out of an experiment I did in 19 uh, in 2001 uh, when I was working with Steven Spielberg on his film Artificial Intelligence. Uh, the kind of had seen the growth of the web over the previous uh, five, six years. Um, I'd started really thinking about what kinds of stories could be told over the web. Um, again, loving history and, and loving to steal liberate from it liberally. One of my, you know, kind of BS theories uh, is that we create new communication technologies. We love doing that as, as humankind. Um, primarily, we use them for the transport transmission of pornography, but then eventually we find other uses for them, and uh, eventually we create new types of stories for those mediums. Um, each time, right, I mean, you, you don't have the novel until you have the printing press, right? You don't have the radio drama until you have radio. The, the, the kind of storytelling mechanisms of cinematography don't exist until you have film. And, and each of these, we've learned to tell stories, but we always start by porting the previous story format onto the new technology, right? So when radio was invented, they put a microphone at a theater play and just recorded it, right? They took a microphone and put it into a symphony and just broadcast it from the symphony. And it takes an innovator, in this case Orson Welles, to say, wait a minute, this is actually a different medium. We're, we're not just sitting in the theater watching the show. We're in these people's living room. We're in their homes. It's a much more intimate experience. Let's tell stories in a different way that actually capitalizes on the fact that we've come to them instead of them coming to us. Right? And we've done that when, you know, when the films started, move, when motion pictures started again. They went, to the, they went back to Broadway, put a camera in front of the stage, filmed stage plays until eventually people started saying, it's a different animal, let's tell stories a different way. Well, the web, I think, is the same thing. All right? What do we do on the web? Most of the time, we broadcast pre-existing forms of media. Um, and I wanted to say, well, what, what would be an organic form of storytelling for, the, for this medium? And to do that, step back and say, what do we do on the medium every day? Well, primarily, we look through a lot of crap that we don't care about, um, trying to find this piece of information we do care about. And liken that to an archaeologist who digs through a ton of dirt, uh, trying to find a shard of pottery. But when she does, 
if she finds enough shards of pottery, she can reconstruct not just the pot, but the entire civilization. And thought, well, that's maybe an interesting way to tell a story. Let's, let's take stories and turn them into those shards and tell them from that way. So my, my opportunity to do that was with this project. Um, and just as a quick example of the kind of clusterfucks you can get into at big companies, uh, we were launching the Xbox, and Microsoft was desperate for kind of relationships with high-profile people. So we met with Spielberg and um, Geffen and uh, the whole crew uh, and went through the presentation on, on artificial intelligence. Uh, and afterwards, um, my boss said, and my boss's boss said, well, what do you think? I said, I said, it could be a really good film, but no one's walking out of it going, God, can't wait to play the game. Um, so I don't think it's a great license for us. Yeah. And they said, yeah, okay, makes sense. And a week later came back and told me that they had paid such a big advance that I had to make six games based upon this very emotional movie of a son desperate for a mother's love. Just the kind of stuff 1835 males are really into. <laughs> um, so given that, I figured I better figure out how to tell a different story because that one wasn't going to be the one that was going to inspire a lot of young guys to grab their joysticks. Um, yeah, we'll, let that, we'll leave that alone. Uh, so the, that very personal story was set against a background that was very fascinating right? and, and had the kind of conflict. And if you, and if you step back from the, the, the mother-son story and looked at it in the larger context of what I thought he was really saying, right? to me it was, it was a story um, that we have repeated as humanity time after time, which is um, we have conveniently defined what is human for our own benefit. Right? We have, you know, on the, cons, uh, on the basis of race or religion, conveniently excluded large numbers of our own population to say, well, they're not human, thus it's okay to exploit them. Right? And that's really, to me, what the movie was about, just putting a different context on it. Right? Um, but indeed, if they, if, regardless of what they're made out of, if they think, if they emote, if they're, you know, if they're human, regardless of what they're made out of, we have to treat them as humans. But, the content, that concept of defining humanity is one that, that has real tension and has real conflict and goes through all our entire history. So putting the movie in that context that was able then to create a timeline of this story of this newest race, you know, fighting for its independence, for its recognition as being part of the human race. Uh, and we then were able to tell stories, set the games at different points along that journey, that conflict. Uh, so that was all good and fine and good, but now we needed a way to tell that story, um, tell that background story that these games were now going to be set against. And that's where I took this concept of how to tell, been messing around with the ideas of how to tell stories on the web, and said, hey, it's a perfectly good excuse to, uh, to experiment with this. Uh, so we put that together with the goal to raise awareness for that story and these Xbox games, um, and uh, it worked really well. Uh, we got about three million people to actively participate in the game over 10 times what our wildest hopes were, uh, and generated about 350 million uh, exposures through the extended media uh, for the film and, and the games. By the way, the games of which were never made. Um, the uh, film came out, we were about three quarters of the way through the games being, being made, uh, and the film bombed uh, here domestically. Um, did reasonably well in Japan, uh, and okay in Europe, but bombed here. And so all the games were canceled. So the games never came out after all that. Um, what was interesting uh, in the, uh, and again, just kind of Hollywood story. So I'm working with Spielberg pretty closely on this, because um, he's really into it. Um, and the original plan, I should back up again from a corporate kind of story. So I go to my bosses and say, here's what I want to do. I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to create all the stuff. I'm going to hide it. It's going to be this great marketing campaign. And so. Um, the guy, my boss's boss, who comes out of marketing, says, so let me, let me get this straight. You're going to spend a lot of money. You're going to create a huge amount of content. You're going to hide it all around the world. And you're going to tell no one that any of it exists. I said, yep, it's great, huh? And he says, you're fucking crazy. That's not marketing. That's, that's anti-marketing. That's insane. I'm not paying for it. I said, OK. And then I went and did it anyway um, by going to Warner Brothers. <laughs> Actually, I sat down with Spielberg and, and, and Kathleen Kennedy and talked to them about it. And they didn't care about the marketing. 
they just love experimenting with storytelling. And so they were excited about it from that point. We got, we got Warner Brothers to pay for half of it. I told them if they paid for half, Microsoft would pay for the other half, which of course was an outright lie. Um, but figured if it worked on the first half, then Microsoft would jump on the bandwagon and they'd pay for the second half, which is, which is what happened. And I figured, you know, I didn't need the job that much if it didn't work. Um, so really it was kind of three, three legs, the transmedia storytelling, the distributed narrative, and the hive mind. Uh, that this whole concept was hung on, and I'll just walk through what those mean. Um, so ARGs, you know, this kind of transmedia, the idea is that it really um, uses the entire network of your life as a way of telling stories. Um, so it's, it's all the pieces of information that you get about the real world can now be subverted and used as a way of telling pieces of this story. Uh, so anything, you know, from, as we've talked about before, you know, your phone, your email, your email, obviously the web, but, but real world places as well. Billboards, murals, street preachers, um, marching bands, fireworks, skywriting, crop circles. We've used it all. <laughs> right. we've, we've put components of stories into all of those, all of those kinds of things. Uh, all, we've delivered cakes with cell phones in them. Um, and it's funny when, you, when a guy's cake starts ringing. Uh, I mean, you can do just all sorts of crazy ways to get little pieces of story out there. Um, and it becomes very immersive. So, um, you know, the, uh, these are, actually these are shots primarily from, I guess the top two are from um, I Love Bees, which is a campaign we did for the launch of, of Halo 2. Um, and uh, you can see back, this was the presidential debates and there's a big I Love Bees banner being created by a bunch of uh, college guys over at ASU. Uh, there, we, the lower one there is in a cemetery. This is uh, we we're doing a program um, that wanted to try to connect uh, video game players with the old west. And uh, one of the things about the old west is is it's actually not very west, right? I mean, the old west starts in Ohio and comes comes west from there. So the vast majority of the country is technically living in where the old west took place. And so the premise was. Let's get people in touch with that by taking them out to the cemeteries where all these people they've read about or heard about are buried. Um, and when you go to a cemetery, kind of like stories come richer to life. So we, we had these kind of, kind of uh, treasure hunts, if you will, take place in cemeteries across the country. Uh, and we also, the, uh, there was a big poker was a big component of this. So we developed this game called Tombstone Poker, um, which is a little reverent, but uh, you would actually use the tombstones as part of your poker hand. Uh, and you had to run around uh, exploring um, the dates that people died as, as the digits for, for them. Um, some of the uh, crop circles, uh, marching bands, street preachers, so on. So all of those are, are parts of the pieces that you can tell stories through. And the idea is that, you're, that, that it's, the story is no longer confined to, to any of the pre-existing boundaries we've put stories in before. Right? And this is that right now all the industries of our storytelling um, uh, industry, if you will, the, the, are, are defined by the four walls of where they tell stories. You've got the TV industry, the movie industry, the, the you know, publishing industry, and they all define themselves by these really artificial containers, right? Um, when in reality, it's just storytelling. And being able to tell stories throughout all of that as one seamless piece is kind of what the goal was. So you, we can invade those people's lives. The distributed narrative, this kind of, um, uh, this is that whole BS I was talking about before. So what do you do to do this? Well, first thing, you write a great story. Um, as always, that's easier said than done. Um, we still, no matter how you change the medium, at the end of the day, it has to be a great story, um, regardless of what medium you tell it in. People have to be able to relate to it, connect to the protagonists, fear the antagonists, you know, um, be happy with the way the plot develops. What's different about this one, though, is we take that story, we create all the evidence had that story actually taken place, whether that's credit card receipts or phone logs or you know video footage from a security camera, and endless other numbers of types of media. We create all that, then we throw the story out. Always breaks the writer's hearts, um, and we plant that evidence all around the world, um, both the physical and digital world, and then um, you inspire the audience to go out and find it and recombine it. Uh, and when they find it and recombine it, they then tell the story to each other. Each piece of evidence inspires a new wave of storytelling. Um, just like, like detectives working at a crime scene, 
uh, if you find a new, a new piece of evidence, you have to recast the crime in your mind and retell the story of what happened. And that's what the audience is doing constantly, every day, as they, as a giant collective, are finding all these pieces and retelling them to each other. And that giant collective was, was the, big, the big enabling component, right, this hive mind. Um, this was the big bet, was that today that could form because of the fact that we have uh, a communication technology that allows us to find like-minded individuals faster than ever before in our history. Um, that, that you could find that, that group that would indeed collaborate in that way. And it's kind of an anti-game design, right? I mean, it's not really a game at all. There's no points, there's no scores, there's no winners, there's no losers. And every, the only way to gain notoriety is to further the ends of the entire group, right? You, you gain notoriety by, by contributing a solution, by contributing things that you found. So it's, it's this very collaborative experience, and thus, in, in some respect, very um, engaging to, to all types of people. There are problems, though. We can <laughs> so um, you got the whole, as we just discussed with it. The, um, to me, a lot of gaming is all about this kind of concept of opportunity of local fame. Uh, we, we thrive off of recognition. Um, it's you know, probably our, our greatest strength and greatest weakness as a species. Uh, and back in the early days, uh, when we did the first network games in, in the uh, mid-80s, um, and the, the long before you could do them at home, we were building these custom entertainment centers, these virtual world centers. Uh, that was the interesting, int most interesting thing to see, is that the notoriety that people gained from, from their accomplishments was vastly more important than any prize you could put on the table. Right? Um, and so that was the, you know, all, everything I've designed since then always tries to take that into account, kind of create that opportunity. Here, m most of the time, it's, it's infamy that you're really gaining, right? If it's a competitive game, you gain notoriety at the cost to someone else, right? Because it's, you're going up, they're going down. Um, and here, the goal was, how can we do that where no one goes down, right? Where it's the, you know, everything you do contributes uh, to you, you know, to you, but also to the entire to the entire gang. Um, so we did some kind of BS math. You know, we were hoping for 250,000 people. Kind of figured if you know go two or three degrees of separation, that they would have as a group access to every skill base and knowledge base on the planet. So again, completely counter to all the years of, of training for me and my team. The goal was not to make something solvable. The goal was to make something impossible, on the premise that this group with the connectivity that was now afforded them by the web, would be able to solve the impossible. Um, we thought it would take a little while to do it. Trick was, when you have three million people, you need zero degrees of separation. So not only um, can they solve anything, but they could solve anything instantly. They had completely unlimited everything, unlimited time, technology, organization, access. They could do and did anything, right? We would shoot do a photo shoot in an alley somewhere here in LA, right? And we would post, and those photos would be discovered as part of the clues in, in what they would do. Not only would they look at the photos and analyze the photos, they would work from that to find the location. They would then scout to send people to actually to the location who would take their own photographs of the location we shot in on the premise that we might have left something behind, right? Because we had designed this thing with no borders, Right, the idea that there was just no end to where this could go, they took that completely literally. Right? We, we, when they started, the first thing they do, right, they, they look at where all the websites are registered, and we had fit, registered all the websites in fake names. Right? Um, the term Puppet Master, uh, which is what's being called the guys who design these games now, uh, came from the fact that we had registered all of the websites in the name of famous puppeteers. Um, because the whole AI story is really kind of a retelling of Pinocchio, um, we figured that was kind of fun. Uh, well, we had one, there was one website not even used that the guy, one of our guys had not shaved his name off of. And so they found him, they found his house, they staked his house out. Um, he wasn't, we basically told them he wasn't allowed to come into work because we didn't want them, because at the time no one knew who was making it. And so we wanted to keep that secret. So the guy was basically under house arrest for like two weeks. Um, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't allowed to go. 
Uh, and you know, we would do something like it was MIT was speaking had a, a, a symposium on, on real artificial intelligence, and we gave one of the speakers there a business card to leave behind on the podium. And one side was in English, the other, and the back side was in a dialect of Indian spoken in Bangalore, only. Um, and uh, we just wanted to see what would happen. Right? Two hours after the conference was over, that business card was scanned online, and you know, two hours afterward, players in India. Um, translated it, and so four hours after the after the after that speaker left the podium, that clue was completely, you know, discovered. So they they literally could solve anything at any point, and we figured, all right, well then we we, we have to slow them down because they were consuming everything we created way too fast. So we um, created this this concept where after jumping through all these incredible hurdles, which took them 10 minutes, they got to the site where they had to figure out on one side you entered a character's name, on the other side you entered an emotional state, and you would get something about that character and that emotional state, a video, a audio, you know, audio clip, a written clip, whatever. Um, but you can only do it one per day, per user. So we figured this will slow them down. Um, no, it didn't slow them down at all. Uh, they sent out a message to all the players and said, don't enter anything. And they organized the group to go off and research emotional states. That group came back, whatever, an hour later, said, here's 47 emotional states. And then they assigned character and emotional states to each of the players. So they organized or you know just instantly on their own a way to then take that database apart in a matter of hours. Right? Uh, so there was really literally nothing they couldn't they couldn't accomplish and this I can go on for hours and hours about that. So as a, as a whole this hive mind is the closest I've seen to God on earth. I mean it really it's just inspiring uh, what they're able to accomplish. But it also has its weaknesses um, because a, that kind of experience, that, that, um, that alternate reality game experience, uh, is like a concert. It interrupts your life. You have to go to it. Um, and being there at Woodstock, yeah, I mean, you're really into it. It changes your life. I mean, we would get, we had dozens of weddings that came out of each of these big alternate reality games because you, you really get into the community, you get into each other, it really has a big impact. It also has no replay value. It's like you know, listening to the album from Woodstock is just you know one one hundredth of what it is to be there. Well, ARGs are even worse. You know, trying to read an AR or read or follow up on all the media and stuff after an ARG takes place, it's really dry and boring. Um, so it just it just doesn't have any real replay value. Um, and so and it, you ha you pretty much literally have to give up your life and attend to it. And it's a pyramidal kind of scheme in terms of the way that the audience works out. The small you know group of people at the top of the pyramid perform the Herokian feats, right? They go answer pay phones in the middle of, you know, hurricanes, and they, you know, will do all sorts of amazing feats, which, which really becomes the entertainment to the large number of people down at the bottom, right? Because the large number of people at the bottom tune in casually to catch up on the story and to watch what these crazy people at the top of the pyramid are doing. Um, the middle part of the pyramid is traditionally been the really hard part for ARGs. These are, this is like, well, I want to do something. I just don't want to watch. I actually want to contribute in a little way. But I'm not a crazy person at the top of the pyramid, so, so what do I do? And traditionally, you would try by, oh, well, we'll make some easy puzzles. Well, that doesn't work, because the guys at the top chew those out in 10 seconds, and, and they've still left nothing for the people who want to be more casually involved. I think um, we started to get some, some of this right with a campaign we did for uh, The Dark Knight. Um, and where basically I, wanted, I came up with the idea that where you had to do something that was really easy to do but required a huge number of people individually to do it. Uh, and so in this case it was uh, they wanted to reveal a picture of Joker um, of, you know, before like some fan did it. They wanted to reveal it in a cool way. Um, and so um, we had dropped um, about a dozen business cards, not business, playing cards of, um, from playing decks with a Joker on it, you know, and a website written on it on the floor of comic shops across the country. Literally just 12 cards. That's all it took. Um, and so people pick those up, they go home, they type in the, the, the URL, and, and they see a picture of the character Harvey Dent um, with Joker's scrawling on it and a place to enter your email address. And if you enter your email address, you get an email from the Joker, and it's dark and it's twisted, and it gives you an X and a Y coordinate and a link. You the link, it takes you back to what looks like exactly the same picture you came from, only instead of the place to enter your email, there's now a place to enter the X and Y coordinate. And when you do that, one pixel of Harvey Dent changes to a pixel of Joker. Um, but 
you have to have a unique email address for every single pixel. So yeah, they could go out and make a lot of email addresses and they, that top of the pyramid started to do that, but they realized it's gonna be much more efficient if they then act as um, the people who go out and gather a huge audience to go and do this. And, and so it really became something which was a very low um, carrying weight for each individual, um, but they all felt like they contributed. Now, of course, the guys at the top of the pyramid can't leave it at that. They have to come up with something crazy to do. So they started writing algorithms that were predicting what it was going to look like um, when finished, right? So you had several different algorithms predicting what the image was going to look like. Uh, and, but they, you know, even if that, that requirement of a huge number of people, it took less than 24 hours uh, for them to propagate that out and change the entire image over to one of Joker and, and reveal it. Um, so after I was done with the first one with um, uh, the Beast uh, for AI, I wanted to then switch the, uh, switch the audience size, go from millions of people to one person. And could we adopt these kinds of transmedia components to a much more intimate uh, experience, which is to me, you know, kind of what the, the reading of a novel has always been. Um, it's on your time, it's at your place, it's on your schedule. I could do it now or I could do it 100 years from now. Um, if it's a good book, you're still going to want to pick it up and read it. Um, so the idea was to, to take it, we have this, this case, it was a girl's journal, um, an 18-year-old girl who um, uh, the book starts with her being dumped by her boyfriend uh, and she's uh, pissed off about that and he says that he's a little too old for her. Uh, which is true, he's like about 150 years too old for her, um, being uh, immortal. Um, and he, uh, you discover this through reading the, the book, but the book comes packaged with all of these ancillary materials, about 35 kind of actually real feeling artifacts that you can spread across your kitchen table. And there are photographs and drawings and birth certificates and Chinese menus and driver's licenses and all that stuff, and then lots of marginalia that goes around as she's an artist um, sketching all throughout the book. And the goal was um, to have those pieces take the story beyond the covers of the book uh, into, the, into the world of the reader. So there is beyond these, these artifacts that are you know, newspaper articles and everything else that are on your kitchen table, there's about a dozen phone numbers there and websites. And if you call the phone number, you'll hear the outgoing message of the character. Um, and if you've read carefully, you'll know their incoming message code, so you can hack their voicemail and listen to all their incoming messages. Uh, and same is true on the website. You can go out the websites and start to find websites. So, like, you know, you've got one of this uh, Chinese um, fortune teller website, uh, and if you, it says enter your birth, birthday for, you know, your fortune. Um, and if you enter your birthday, you get a fun little fortune. But if you enter, enter characters' birthdays, you get really telling fortunes that really give you. So each of these are simple little solvable puzzles um, for an individual, but they, they start to break down that world. And, and you know, listening to um, a Chinese hitman uh, on the phone for, is a re lot more impactful um, than reading that section in the book. Uh, but yet we didn't want to do it where it's kind of like, well, read chapter one, now make this phone call. Right? Instead, we left that totally separate pieces. So you can just read the book all the way through, and if you're done, you're done. But if you want to immerse yourself deeper into her world, pick up the phone and pick up the mouse, go out and start exploring her world. Um, and what we, uh, what we did is we, you know, the book comes to a satiating close, but two of the biggest mysteries aren't in the book at all. They're in all this web of content that, that, that goes around the book. So that was kind of a fun, um, a fun uh, way to take that and, and look at that in, in a different way, and doing a lot more work on, on those kinds of things now with, with a couple more series of books. Um, I'm going to switch for the last couple of minutes. No, we don't want that now. Um, to uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing over at Smith and & Tinker, and then come back and take some questions. Um, hold on. Uh, okay. There we go. Um, so we, we talked about kind of the concept that we were tro trying to approach at Smith and Tinker, bringing uh, the physical and the virtual uh, and the online back together. Uh, and the the piece that that uh, we've created is a product called Nanovore nanoscopic carnivores, um, 
or nanovore. It's, you know, using a bad Hollywood tagline, it's kind of uh, Pokemon meets a Tamagotchi on steroids uh, as if it was directed by Quentin Tarantino. Um, and uh, the goal there is to kind of take the dynamics of, a, of a, like a Pokemon trading card game. And I don't know if you've ever seen kids play. Well, some of you, some of you might have been kids when Pokemon trading cards first came out. Um, but when my kids uh, were that age and they were playing Pokemon, um, it was really clear to see, and I think it's still the same today, that's a really hard game, actually. <laughs> it's a really sophisticated game. And younger kids who are very attracted to the concept of the game and the characters of the game try to play the game, and they can't. So they make up their own game, which is fine and great, until they meet another kid who made it up a different way. And then they get into big fights, and they get into big fights all the time. Uh, and that was, a, to me, a, a, was a real problem, because you know, it was taking something my sons enjoyed and it was kind of souring it for them. And then the other part that was always ish, an issue is like, you know, they'd get these rare cards and they'd be so excited to take that rare card to school. And the one thing I knew is that card was not coming home. I was gonna have a crying son that evening um, because he was gonna you know, lose it or was gonna get stolen or some kid was gonna trade him a bunch of crap for it. And he wouldn't know that until he got home. So, um, so yes, I'm, this product is my way of you know, making up for all of my son's bad childhood. Um, and by doing that, is, the goal there is to try to create this as a virtual trading card uh, kind of dynamic that, that lets the kids have actually even more strategy than you would have available to you in the Pokemon kind of card game environment, but without those, um, those uh, problems. Uh, and primarily also a way of, of getting kids back at the tabletop. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna play a TV ad, um, which I'll apologize ahead for doing so. Um, and, and by the way, whenever you make a kid's TV ad, by law, there's, you have to hire this tacky announcer guy. Um, and uh, it's, it's like in every you know, network contract. Um, so it has a tacky announcer guy. You are not going to believe this. Lucas Nelson has discovered an online world of nanoscopic creatures. Nanovore. They live in computer chips. You can't see them. Okay, you can with this. Nanoscope, the only place to train your nanovore with mini games and solo battle cartridges. Go head to head, connecting up the four nanoscope handhelds for explosive action. Yes. And you can download new, more powerful nanovore from your PC. Connect, collect, and battle. Nanovore, nanoscope, and solo battle cartridges each sold separately. Ask your parents to go online. Nanovore.com. I gotta tell somebody. But who? But who? Got to always end on a mystery. I, actually, they don't usually, but I like ending on a mystery. So, um, yeah, so the idea is you have this online game, and you download, you know, monsters, and you evolve those, train those monsters, and you fight them against friends around the world, and, um, and then you can trade with people online uh, as well. And that's all good. That's the home-to-home, -home, you know, virtual kind of part. But, again, the goal is want to get kids back together physically. Well, the reason they don't normally get back together physically is because all that stuff I just described, it's really hard to do face to face, right? All the badges and the awards and the, the fact that those characters get cooler and cooler um, doesn't happen with a cardboard card, right? Um, so that's where these come in, right? We download your characters um, through the USB, and then you go and, and play with friends. Um, now, immediately people always say, well, well why don't you just do that on like a DS or you know, maybe on a PSP? PSP is the wrong audience, number one, um, and DS actually really can't handle what we're trying to do. But part of what we wanted to do was really encourage this kind of huddle dynamic, and thus the, that whole concept, the idea that, that my monsters jump across onto your screen and yours jump across onto mine, and to watch it, we've got to huddle together, um, really became kind of the way of modeling that that playing card dynamic, right? So the premise is when I'm making my move, I have my hand of cards right here, and it's secret. I'm doing what I'm doing, and you're doing what you're doing secretly as well. And then we put our cards down on the table, and now we see what happens. Um, and it was really trying to model very directly that experience, but now give it all the benefits that come from an online experience. Um, so we play, it records everything we do, so that when I go home and I, my guy needed 10 kills to be able to evolve to the next guy, I got him by playing my friend in the school bus. I didn't have to wait and do it at home, you know, remotely. We could do it person to person. And then, of course, when I'm by myself, I, I can, you know, use this with playing mini games to, you know, build up points to enhance my characters yet further. So you have that, that, that whole dynamic, basically the premise being of trying to deliver all of the benefits um, of... Uh, 
uh, online to, uh, to them face to face. Now in a vague attempt to try to bring this back to closure with my opening stuff about world building, um, hacking together multiple <laughs> presentations in one. Um, so how do we set that into a world that made sense for kids? Well, uh, in that kind of real science is not real hard premise, uh, I, love, I love trying to create a situation where it becomes easier for kids to suspend disbelief uh, or adults to suspend disbelief. When you start with something they know or kind of quasi know is real. And if they, you know, if they start with that and then you're able to come off of that, it gets a little bit um, easier to suspend disbelief. Two, um, so that's one part I wanted to try to accomplish with this video I'm going to show. And then the other is um, we, our animated story for this age kids, Pokemon wouldn't be Pokemon without a daily cartoon, right? Um, well, we, we didn't have that kind of money. We couldn't do a, a daily cartoon. And, um, and now you've got such a centralized media environment with Cartoon Network owning basically all the boys and Nickelodeon owning everybody else, um, some of the boys and all the girls. Um, and they know that. So not only do you have to pay the $20 million to make your own TV show, then you have to pay them to air it, and you have to give them a huge percentage of the merchandising profits. So it gets really expensive uh, if you want to go that direction. But our whole premise is these kids are online. Uh, so if they're online, then we should be able to reach them directly with, with cartoons and medium, uh, media um, and do it in a way that it's kind of more of the YouTube format, if you will. Right? It's a short form, uh, two minute type animated series. So we, we actually are producing a weekly animated show. It's only it's two minutes rather than 22 minutes. This was uh, the first episode. I'm going to show you a couple episodes just uh, bang through. Lucas Nelson Vidlog, start date, um, oh yeah, Tuesday, okay. Now, if you're watching this video, I'm either dead, missing, or I've been grounded. Either way, however you got this, and whoever you are, you're not gonna believe this. Oh, okay, wait, back up. Before I jump straight into the crazy, a, l a little background info. See, we just finished this extremely cool unit on dust mites at school. Now, these freaky little microscopic monstrosities live literally everywhere, like, like all over our skin, and in our hair, on the dog, now, in order to observe the little buggers in their natural habitat, I built this. So here's where it gets interesting. And by interesting, I mean utterly off the map whacked! There, did you see that? Okay, me neither. Aha! Now what in the name of Nikolai Tesla is that thing? Well, at first I thought it was a new kind of dust mite, right? But the thing is, it's not on the computer, it's like in the computer. And, and when I say in, I mean not just hanging out on the motherboard or something, but actually like living in the chip. See, computer chips are made out of... Whoa! See? Now dust mites definitely do not shoot lightning at each other. Ever! Nor do they headbutt. Not even the Scottish ones. I gotta tell somebody about this, but who? Mr. Sapphire. Oh, man. Lucas! You better not be making another dumb action figure movie with my video camera. Oh, psh. Um, all right, so I'll show uh, this one real quick. This is just uh, one of the things we want to do with kids, hopefully, is not only get them into the game, but also if they get a little curious about science and about some of the backgrounds on things, it's really easy for them to dig in deeper, right? They're already on a computer. They already have Google. Um, and I've seen this with my youngest, uh, really difference between my older ones and my youngest one. I mean, the youngest one was, was like, you know, grew up on Google, right? And the kid ha has this amazing capability to just dive into anything that he gets interested in immediately and, and satiate himself on it, which is fantastic. Um, and it's like, kind of like, you know, goes way beyond pornography. It's great. Um, and, uh, and I just, you know, the hope is, is that if you get kids a little interested in stuff that they, they are now at their fingertips have the, uh, the ability to go deeper. Here they go. You would have loved ancient Rome. Oh, that was awesome. I mean, awful. This is uh, a science a tragedy, teacher. He went really. and told the science teacher afterwards. What if he had a hot date tonight? You're clearly devastated, but maybe unnecessarily. Wait, I thought that one was dead. Apparently, the nanovore are capable of spontaneous self-resurrection. How can any living thing do that? No carbon-based living thing can. Of course. 
The nanovore live in the silicon of computer chips because they are made of silicon. No, wait, that's backwards. The computer chips are made of the nanovore. Whoa, 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 whoa. back up a sec. Nanovore? I had to start calling them something. Cool. Okay, follow me on this one. Dust mites are some of the smallest and oldest living things on Earth. The nanovore are even smaller, so let's suppose they are even older. So old that they predate even the dinosaurs by billions of years. Oh, really old. Molten lava covering most of the Earth's surface kind of old. It would make sense for a silicon life form to develop while rock was still liquid. They could have existed for a billion years until the seas formed and the microscopic plankton changed the Earth's atmosphere. Change the air from what to what? The Earth's first atmosphere was nitrogen and the plankton's waste product is oxygen. So we breathe plankton poop? So... As the Earth cooled, the nanovore must have become extinct. Their fossils are what we call sand, crystal, and, of course, silicon. Fast forward several billion years until 1958 when Fairchild Semiconductor made the first integrated circuit out of silicon. Yes, so then the possibility exists that when electricity first flowed through a chip that contains a nanovore's DNA, it comes back to life within the chip itself. And since everything runs on chips now, the nanovore could be anywhere. Or more likely, everywhere. Well, we wanted to have a lot of them to be able to sell, so, you know, you got to have a universe that uh, is rather extensive. Yeah, the, uh, the plankton poop was one of my favorite lines ever. Um, uh, the, the fun part here, I guess, you know, one of the, one of the joys of, of kids finally growing up um, is uh, my, my middle son, Nate, is actually quite a talented uh, screenwriter. He's at DePaul uh, studying uh, playwriting, screenwriting, and so we wrote all the scripts for these together, which was, which was a lot of fun. Now, my animators are going to require that I'm going to show you what, we, what they look like now, because um, the other ones, the earlier ones, look really bad compared to where, where we are now. Now, I know you're the battle queen. It's master money. As in master. How can anyone be so good at kicking so much butt and look so awesome doing it? <laughs> okay, okay. But check this out. I learned this last night. Yawn. Seriously, it rocks. So first, I execute a swap block. Whoa, what's that? Then, execute my swap. And then, oh yes, an armor-piercing attack. <laughs> okay, color me impressed. Like through the fire and flames on expert impressed. How'd you do that? I realized using combos makes attacks way more effective. The first part of the combo doesn't seem all that powerful, but it makes the second part do stuff it normally can't. I call it a combo play. Combo play? It's a force of nature! Yeah, I kinda am. Well, damn it. What do you want? No, geek. No more words. You guys think you're so clever. So smart. You bookworms love to make me feel stupid. Nathan tricked me the first time I tried to get your game. Then Ben chewed me up for being a moron. Well, here's a quiz question, nerd. Guess who's really tired of feeling stupid? Uh, you? Give me the freaking game, geek! Come on, man! Y you're out of your mind! Can't we talk about- No more words. Here comes the fun part. <laughs> Thanks for saving my bacon. What was that? A combo play, of course. Um, oh, all right, one, one short last story and then uh, take questions. The uh, little reference to uh, Nicole, uh, Nikola Tesla, which you guys got. Kids rarely do, surprisingly. Um, but uh, some people, when, when people look at like the uh, ARG stuff and, and uh, ask me about, you know, that kind of elaborate, involving 
um, kind of experience used as marketing, do I think that's, you know, overkill? Uh, and there's a whole other discussion of kind of what is marketing, what is advertising, what is content. But in terms of the phrase, is that overkill, it always takes me back to um, the marketing campaign that Thomas Edison used against Nikola Tesla um, when, the, when it was the AC versus DC battles. And this was a, um, a battle of two different electrical theories back at the turn of the century. Uh, and Edison, of course, had invented a DC. Tesla came and made his DC much better and then invented AC. Um, out on his own. We all use, the whole world uses AC power uh, at this point. And one of the reasons is because DC power is really dangerous. You know, high voltages of DC will zap you in a second. Um, but uh, Edison's marketing campaign was all about how AC power was so dangerous. And the way that he, uh, um, he did this, he, you know, in, he was a very innovative guy, uh, came up with the concept of street teams. The street teams were it was sent around the country and would take, find stray cats and dogs and electrocute them uh, in little demonstrations right in your neighborhood, um, showing you how dangerous AC power was. Um, and then when that wasn't winning the battle for him, he went the next step further and um, convinced the New York State Legislature, of where he was an incredibly powerful guy, to switch their method of execution from hanging to electrocution. And he invented the electric chair using AC power, of course, specifically for them to do that. Um, so that he could then, you know, make sure that all the headlines read, man electrocuted to death by AC power. So, the electric chair is indeed a marketing campaign. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> so with that one, i uh, happy to take questions on, on all the crazy disjointed things I've just presented. So pretty much everything you mentioned today is, well, maybe apart from some of the alternative reality games, is oriented on men on, or boys. So what about girls? Do they not go into this kind of thing, or do they have some special other games like that you didn't talk about, or is it for the uh, alternate reality games? Yeah, alternate reality uh, games, those things like the games for kids and so on. So the uh, well, actually, the alternate reality games are um, almost they're actually slightly tilted towards females. We run about 65, uh, like about 60-40 female-male split. It's one of the few game uh, formats that both male, men and women play that's actually higher towards females. And I think the, the primary reason is, you know, you have a very, story being such a large component of it. Um, there being, it's, you know, being a very collaborative nature of it. So there you actually, as we, you know, um, have a very, very large female par participation. Uh, games like Battletech or, you know, where it's, it's a straight out kind of combat oriented game, uh, it's, you know, very small female participation ship. Um, in uh, Nanovore, it's totally to tell. We think, you know, the, the fact that there's, um, it's more aggressive, right, instead of the characters falling asleep like they do in Pokemon, you've got that whole kind of, you know, as directed by Quentin Tarantino component. Um, so we certainly think it's going to scale, you know, skew more boys. Um, we don't really have any the, any of the data yet to say it's too early to too early to say. But I would be surprised if it isn't majority boys um, in that regard. But I think girls, you know, girls play games. There's, there's that myth always that girls don't play games. And the biggest single audience online is still women over 30 play more games than anybody else. You know, than all the boys combined. Um, they're just different. They're not you know, Halo and, and uh, World of Warcraft, right? They're, um, you know, uh, kind of what I would call more of the um, uh, kind of, what's the right phrase? Um, things like uh, Tetris and, and stuff that, uh, there's a great phrase for this, that uh, Al, uh, Al, the guy who invented Tetris um, worked for me for a while at Microsoft and he had a phrase for this which was great. Because he didn't really call them games, it was more—it was more like contemplative ex exercise, right? They kind of, you kind of slow yourself down and relax and focus, you know, on them. Um, and that's, that's usually the thing. And then, you know, everything from Diner Dash to 
um, you know, to the big mystery games um, are, you know, huge female participation. So it's not, it's not that girls don't play games in any way. It's just a matter of they play different. You know, there's a spectrum of games. Big Zen diagraph. We overlap in some of it. We don't overlap in others. Okay, one more if I may. Uh, have you ever been, well, not you personally, but uh, regarding alternative, alternative reality gaming, have you ever somehow been faced with accusations that those games addict people and pull them into the fake world and so on? I mean, a lot of people say that the internet itself already is already addictive and if you put a game which basically makes you spend a lot of time on it, it might cause such reactions, I would say. Yeah, I th you know, I've been, Involved of, with activities that that carry that um, uh, accusation for a long time, right? I mean, you go back into the '80s, and there were 60-minute stories about Dungeons and Dragons, and and how it was uh, addictive and it was killing the youth of America. Um, and you know, it's the same. You know, same is said. You know, it could be said of the alternate reality game format that we created. Uh, the truth is, I think. Anything that has a, a, an emotional significance for you, you can create a dependency upon, right? Um, whether that's, you know, a, a wider, you know, anything that has it, right? Um, and so I think, you know, it's all things, all things in moderation. Do we, I certainly think, though, that we've seen, I mean, we, we have no, no documentation at all of any, of any kind of negative experiences of murders or, or people losing their lives. Uh, in alternate reality games, we have the inverse. We have lots of, you know, we've been invited to, you know, dozens and dozens of weddings um, that that resulted from them. We've gotten, you know, people who talked to us about, you know, things like those experiences in the cemeteries um, provided, you know, really interesting cathartic closure to a lot of people for for losses in their lives. Um, so, you know, I think we've seen, we know it can have a big emotional impact, and yes, that means that it can also potentially have a negative emotional impact. Um, I, I think that's, I guess, it's true of any, of any experience. Uh, I think that comes down to us as creators trying to take some responsibility for what we create. Um, I, you know, in the games that I create, kind of my guiding line is I try not to create things that have reproducible violence, right? Like, I really am not worried that kids aren't going to go out and create a 30-foot tall robot and go kill somebody with it. Um, but I'm not a big fan of like, you know, training them how to use a 45 in a building, um, uh, in a first-person shooter. Um, but everybody, you know, has got their own kind of their own kind of ability to create and sleep with what they create, and you draw your own your own lines there. Uh, but yes, I think um, uh, I think anything can become addictive if used in the wrong way. Can you tell us something you've learned about social gaming as a business model that surprised you or you didn't expect you were going to find out? Wow, there's, that's a, there's so much. Um, because uh, it's, um, it, it is constantly surprising. Uh, I think you know, beyond the, as a business model, beyond the things of, of kind of what people accomplish, uh, going back to the previous question, right? Um, Addictiveness is actually a key component of a business model, right? Uh, any kind of game that has a repeat purchase model uh, is indeed, you know, betting on uh, that there's a driver for people to come back and purchase multiple times uh, for the ability to, whether it's, you know, get better at the game, whether it's, you know, have more notoriety within the, you know, within the social environment that they've become kind of emotionally invested in. Um, you know whether it's it's just the completest nature, but even even people who are like collecting to complete are usually not doing that in uh, um, in segregation, right? They're, they they want to show off their collection, right? Um, because that's that's part of what that that desire to collect the whole set is about. So I think that um, you know the, the the great strengths and weaknesses of of the social gaming platform are uh, that it indeed is about showing off to other people, right? Um, and so it is, I always say, you know, the, the traditional, quote unquote, traditional massively multiplayer online game 
is a bit like giant, you know, uh, gold gyms. Uh, for the most part, what you're doing there is just, you know, pumping up and then parading around, <laughs> showing off what you've accomplished to others, right? Um, they're actually, they actually are multi, they're massively multiplayer single, massively single player games in reality, um, for the most part. Um, the only multiplayer part is the showing off part. The actual accomplishing things is all single player. <laughs> Um, so it's, you know, you work out on the machine and then you preen around and show everybody. Um, so I do think that that, that is the biggest economic driver, um, the fact that you want recognition from your peers. Uh, and you will do whatever it takes to gain recognition from your peers. As we've seen in real life, unfortunately, that's when, you know, people also do very negative things to gain recognition, right? Um, if, the game provides, if the game provides avenues for negative, for people to gain negative reputation, they will as well. And it's one of the things when you're, designing a game, it's one of the key axes you have to think about in that regard because they will gain notoriety any way possible and that includes breaking your game, right? And doing, you know, doing terrible things to other players just like people do in real life. If you give them that avenue and it's easier to gain notoriety that way than it is the positive way that you want them to do it, they will do it the negative way. Um, so it's, you really want to watch out for those axes because it's what drives people. Um, is multicultural or cross-cultural factor uh, one of the contents in your creation, or has it occurred to you uh, to take the multicultural uh, things into your creation so that through these um, very exciting games, the young people or the kids can know better about other cultures, or uh, uh, do you have um, many market shares in other uh, continents or countries <laughs> besides America? Thank you. Um, sure. Uh, so the answer is that I, uh, I love history and mythology of, of many, many cultures and incorporate a lot of that into my work. Um, does it mean that we actually gain market share outside the countries? Yes and no. Uh, you know, for instance, Shadowrun, uh, Shadowrun, which is a sci-fi fantasy game, is entirely based upon um, Mayan mythology. Right, and the whole 2012 end of the world, um, which is not really the end of the world, the begin, end of the fourth world, beginning of the fifth world concept uh, is what that whole game was about, which I wrote back in, in 85. Um, and, you know, does that mean that, that we opened up a big, you know, Mesoamerican marketplace to us? Not, not really, um, because the kinds, of these, you know, these kinds of games weren't at the time very popular. Um, in uh, Central and in Central and Southern America, um, but I do think that it exposed those concepts and those characters and that mythology to people all across Europe and the United States, um, and and then in Japan when, with the video games. Uh, so it exposed people to it, and I think that had benefit. Didn't exactly really open a new market for us. Um, it is, I mean, in terms of looking at different marketplaces, European and American, Asian. Um, it's really hard to design for another culture. Um, it's, I, and, and so I don't think I could claim that I've ever successfully designed something thinking I'm designing this for a Japanese audience and it's just going to work like crazy in Japan. Uh, I have not done that. Um, have I taken lots of things I love about, you know, Japanese mythology and, and Chinese and, you know, and other cultures and incorporated into the stories I've created? That I do all the time, and that I think of, that we've done very successfully. And sometimes it creates a little niche opening in those markets, but it's pretty hard. You know, it's, I always use the spaghetti westerns uh, as an example. You know, it's you know, it's a lot of a lot of westerns were made in Italy <laughs> and, uh, because they loved that that genre. You know, and very few of them were successful here, right? Uh, well, I I created a giant robot game because I loved. Uh, a lot of what the Japanese had done with the giant robots. I loved the visuals, right? But the stories that they had created were, you know, not really ones that spoke to me um, for American kids. So I took, you know, kind of the parts I loved and wrote a whole new story around it. Well then, you know, does my giant robot game sell really well in Japan? You know, surprisingly, no. <laughs> uh, it's done, I mean, you know, not, not surprisingly, no, right? It's again kind of shipping a spaghetti western back, back home. Um, so it's, I think, 
the people who accomplish that, and there are people who have accomplished it brilliantly. I mean, I think um, uh, we see a lot more of, um, I think the polyglot nature of the United States makes it the easiest market to have foreign creative concepts be successful in. I think going back to more homogeneous cultures from here is a tougher, has, has always been a tougher sell. Thank you.
One thing we also need to do, Priya, is um, set everything back to HD. Do you want me to show you how to do that? I think, oh, I'll try and figure it out. If you can't figure it out, then. I mean, isn't it like. We scale it all down to 1024 by 6.68. Uh huh. We need to make it okay. I was gonna do it from. Am I doing it right? I just go into here and then I do. I'm changing it back to seven. Do you carry on an LLC <laughs> if you do everything right? Yeah. I'm gonna m make you nervous again. I know. You don't make me nervous. <laughs> The only way you can learn it really is just by mm -hmm. troubling your way through it. Okay, ten twenty four by seven six eight, but there's no um, seventy. Alright, but we need to. But remember, ten twenty four by seven six eight is is the resolution we need for streaming. If we want oh. HD, we need to go much higher. Right. Do you, do you remember what it is? I don't. I didn't. I write it down. I mean, oh, it's mil. It's nineteen twenty by ten eighty. Nineteen twenty by ten eighty. But if you look, you're on look at that. You're on the HP display there. Yeah. So bear in mind. I don't know. Did I learn this? Let me write it down. You know, you maybe haven't. Because I feel like I would have written. It yeah, you maybe haven't. If you look, there's two okay. displays. Okay. There's this which came up, but behind it is display. Okay. So what, what that's basically saying is these are the resolutions for this. The okay. HP it even says HP on it. Okay. And this says display rather than like Canon or whatever it is. Okay. Because it's because it's going through that switch, actually. It doesn't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So this one, you can easily do 1925 It's the only okay. option at the bottom. So that's for the projector. Okay. So you'll see um, it changes the whole thing because remember how to describe this. The best way to show you is mm -hmm. at the back of this computer, there's two This that needs to happen. In fact, I'd be curious to see right. how it boots up. Because oh, <laughs> oh no. well, one thing is with the computer. So let me turn up here. Uh, <laughs> it's not in a good spot, to be honest. No, that was me leaning on it. Don't be excuses. No, I mean it isn't in a good spot. But I think the design of this yeah. is actually to have a door on it. Ah. Uh, so, hmm. so I guess that's good to know. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so that's for the projector, and then the other one's just for. Well, remember that when we, we have two inputs coming into this, uh -huh. we have the one, the one that we that he used then was a mirror from that switcher. It's splitting it to all our mm -hmm. sources. Mm -hmm. But when you go up to displays and it shows you the displays and mm -hmm. it says HP, it's mm -hmm. referring to the fact that there's a DVI cable mm -hmm. going in here. Okay. And okay. This yeah, that that, I get that now. So just just log in. Hey, no, that's fine. Uh, it should be, if, if there was any left, it would have been on the top table. No, no. Um, all right, so we're back to where we started from, which is good to know, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, so let's go back to the system preferences. Okay. So just system references and displays. Mm -hmm. And you did the right thing, right? The HP. Now the HP is 1920 by 1200 because it's wider. Mm -hmm. But it's still not right, so something's wrong here. Mm -hmm. Do well, you know what it is? It has to be four by 
day? No. No, 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 no. Well, that's a good call. I mean, you could test that. You could go, mm -hmm. okay, what, what difference does it make when I press a 4 by 3 mm -hmm. Okay, it makes it stretch, but it still doesn't look very right. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be 4 by 3 But the trick is this. This has been set to XGA, so we have to make it 1080p. Okay. 1080p means 1920 by 1080. That's, okay. that's what it is. XGA means 1024 by 768. Okay. And it's so easy for me <laughs> to say it because I yeah. deal with these numbers all the time. But So when this is pushed back okay. to 1080p in theory, yeah, we get a full screen here, we get a full screen there. Okay. We can press that auto position just to make sure mm -hmm. it's all adjusted. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I can show you, just, I know you're going to go really quickly. So no, it's okay. what it's referring to is this, what you're seeing now, is, exac is exactly the same as that. Okay. But if we turn mirrored displays off, okay. you'll still see that this is exactly the same as that. Yes. Mirror, which, isn't a, a, which isn't a dual display. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done dual display on your laptop? No, no, okay. I just from here. Okay, but, it, but it's saying it's the same thing. Okay. And it's because it, this is the same signal being split, mm -hmm. but we have, this, we have the, the separate computer signal is that digital DVI. Okay. And then you'll see that we have two separate displays. Okay. Okay. So that when it says HP, blah, 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 mm -hmm. it's referring to, like the I'll TV show you, like if I change this now, mm -hmm. it's not... Oops. When I change it on here, mm -hmm. okay, now I'm really confused. <laughs> oh, it does it anyway. Hmm. But it's only changing the screen resolution on this one. Mm -hmm. So it's always staying 1024 by 768 yeah. on that one? Uh -huh. Because it's two signals. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to describe it to you. I, I think I'm getting it. I'm just the, the, basically the trick so. is you want it on you want it on the one that it was already on. Okay. And to make sure that the display one says nineteen twenty by ten eighty. Okay. So sorry, so for the input you want it on input DVI digital? No. You ignore. You only use that when you need to dual screen. You know, we'll do some training. I realize you weren't at training. You know, we've we finished now. Okay, hey, one second. I'll be out there in one second. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Bye. Sorry. 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 No, no. L l I forgot. You weren't at the training. I did go over this way more detail. So let's. Yeah, that's. Let's nice. just have some training with you and probably some extra person because mm -hmm. I need to get someone to replace Maggie for these jobs. Cause she right. Doesn't want to do them and that's why you're so behind. I just realized. I didn't. Sorry, yeah. It is all new. <laughs> I'm over no, me. you're right. It is all new to you. Yeah, but I mean, I can learn it like. Yeah, it's it's it's, it it's 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 not very intuitive, mm -mm. and I can't make it more intuitive. The way that it's <laughs> set up at the moment, and right. I can't really. That's I don't okay. know, like it's as simple as I can get it. That was pretty simple. I mean, I can I can tell if I studied it, then I would. I would get it. Yeah, it's more. I have to. Sh I'll show you the back, and it will make more sense. Okay. Alright, awesome. see you later. <laughs> Thanks for working and uh